about narrative correction. Um, and it is also a work uh, to try and explain the ways that challenges in Africa, of which we may be quite familiar, are actually opportunities to innovate. Um, and that resource scarcity and the kind of constraints that you may encounter in day-to-day -day life uh, on the continent are um, in fact generative. They can be very productive and they unleash certain types of creativity that you may not find elsewhere in the world. So the book profiles entrepreneurs and individuals who are creating businesses to address social challenges um, with a unique African twist. Alexis? Yes, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Um, so my book is about ordinary people fighting extremism on the continent. It focuses on four extreme situations in uh, Nigeria, uh, northeastern Nigeria, northern Uganda, Somalia, and Mauritania. And it's about telling stories from a different way. It's about the people at the center of these conflicts or um, societies that are being overturned by terrorist forces and how people uh, protect their ways of life, protect their families, get through to the other side and preserve some kind of normalcy. Um, I wanted to tell the people, the stories of the people um, who have agency, who are not just victims and suffering whatever chaos has been thrown upon their life, but how they manage to resist the status quo in, ex in extreme ways, dramatic ways, but also in ordinary, everyday ways, acts, um, acts of bravery, acts of courage that people on the continent exhibit every day. So um, now I would like for us to sort of hear, especially for the, those, again, that, who haven't you know, read the books, um, wanted to hear from each of you a, a, a little piece or a reading um, from your book. So I think we'll start with Alexis. Yes, so let's start with you. Sure, so one of, the one of my subjects in the book is a man nicknamed Elder. Um, Elder lives in Maiduguri and he watched his home kind of fall apart around him due to Boko Haram. Uh, he felt helpless, but then he decided to do something about it. Bo Boko Haram focused its onslaught on Elder's hometown. Once an ancient center of Islamic teaching and trade, Maiduguri was, by 2013, a city of sandbag bunkers and security checkpoints that, dis that disfigured its streets. Soldiers manned the buckers and checkpoints and stood in the roads, guns cocked, monitoring traffic. Sometimes the soldier wore masks. Most of the time they appeared to be barely wearing any protective gear at all. Sections of the city were reduced to rubble. The attacks were unpredictable and chilling. In June, two th in June 2011, Boko Haram bombed a beer garden. It also set off bombings at markets and police stations and on crowded stretches of streets. Boko Haram attacked civilians seemingly at random ripping into their homes, killing their parents, stealing their daughters and sons. It really hurt me, Elder recalled, but we were handicapped, we couldn't do anything. We were even afraid to report it to the military or authorities because if you report it, a few days later Boko Haram will just come and kill you. This was not the Nigeria he knew. This was not the Islam he knew. This was something different and terrifying. People Elder knew began to flee town. His friends were killed. In 2012, one of Elder's cousins was shot in the leg by Boko Haram gunmen when they encountered him at his house. The cousin had been sitting outside, enjoying a moment of free time. He soon left the city with his family. A friend of Elder's, a state assemblyman, visited Elder and his family one day that same year. Elder later learned that his friend had been shot in his house right after leaving Elder's. And to make matters worse, his, his brother's own son had joined Boko Haram. When the insurgency began in 2009, his nephew was attending the sermons of Muhammad Yusuf, the founder of Boko Haram, and he ran away that year from Maiduguri. Everyone knew he had joined the group. There was no sound logic behind the killings. They killed you if they thought you worked with the government, or sometimes if you worked at all, or if you had your children enrolled in school, or if you were simply trying to live your life and take care of your family. Elder felt helpless. At any point, you could hear a gunfire close to your own home. No one was safe. Even if you survived a Boko Haram attack, you then had to make it through the military roundup that followed. After an attack, the insurgents dispersed, often hiding among residents. Soldiers swept through neighborhoods, detaining every boy and man they saw, taking many back to a military base outside of town called Giwa Barracks. The road to the base was long and windy, nearly deserted, through beige sand and dirt and skeletal trees. 
They even took Elder from his house once in 2011 and beat him. A soldier hit him on the head with a gun so hard he was bleeding. He had to get stitches. Looking back, Elder said he couldn't blame the military for what they did. The people weren't providing the soldiers with information about the insurgents, so what did they expect? They couldn't just hide terrorists and not expect the military to react after so many of their own had been killed. He had forgotten how scared he and his neighbors had been to report on Boko Haram. Either the group could have found out and retaliated against them, or the military could have accused them of being terrorists themselves and taken them. Elder had become used to death, the idea of it, the presence of it, the inevitability, the inevitability of it. It was all around him all the time, a sticky, sour thing that he could touch and smell and feel. It was not supposed to be like this. Everyone was afraid of Boko Haram, but no one wanted to talk about them, much less risk reporting them to the military. If you saw members on the street, you walked past them and said nothing. Boko Haram extorted business owners and white-collar professionals, regular payments they had to make to stay alive. They paid without protests. There was nothing else to do. So it surprised everyone when, in June 2013, a mild-mannered taxi driver named Luan Jafar apprehended a Boko Haram member in an area of Maiduguri. With a few other men in tow, Jafar went to the home of a man he believed was involved with the terrorists. They found him in possession of a gun and turned him over to the security forces. News spread of the citizen's arrest. People talked about how Jafar was a hero, a simple man who had done something even the military couldn't do. It was inspiring. Men and some women in other quarters then banded together. Elder considered Jafar a would-be martyr who had truly sacrificed himself and enviably, and enviably become a leader in the process. He set out to emulate him. His neighborhood was the fourth to join. We knew the Boko Haram, Boko Haram members who were living in the neighborhood with us, he said. We just started getting them in the night. We would catch them and then bring them to the authorities. He was the oldest of the group he joined up with back then a loose association of men who lived, near each who lived near each other. They used sticks and cutlasses to defend themselves. The very first day, they went after three young men who they suspected of being militants. The suspects all lived with their parents in the neighborhood. Elder and the 30 other men were organized. They headed on foot to the suspects' houses. At the first house, they didn't find anyone. At the house of the next one, they found all three of them together. The, the relatives of the second man were also there. They watched stunned as Elder and the group crashed into the main room and tied the hands of each man behind his back and then led them outside. They didn't say a word, Elder recalled, because they know the habits of their boys. He told the young men that he knew who they were and what they did with Boko Haram. The suspects were laughing. They had tried to run when Elder and the rest came in but had nowhere to go. They had known the vigilantes would be coming after them but seemed to be in a state of disbelief. The men said that they weren't the only Boko Haram members in the area. They started calling out names, people Elder and his group would pursue in the following days. The three men then said they had made a mistake joining the insurgents, but Elder barely listened. He didn't care about their regret or remorse. I didn't have any sympathy for them whatsoever, he said. The next morning, the men's parents came to the vigilantes and begged them to release their sons. Elder refused. He said he had turned them over to the military. He hadn't heard news of them since. Now, any place where residents knew Boko Haram members to be living, the new militias gathered together in groups of 10 or 15, piled into a vehicle, and took suspects by force. When people heard what they were doing, hundreds of men and boys joined them, and terrorists began fleeing town. Within a week of forming, the vigilante groups had cleared the city. The neighborhood groups organized themselves into 10 sectors with command structures, and they called themselves the Civilian Joint Task Force. The CJTF, as it was known, was made up of volunteers, professionals, civil servants, students and traders armed with machetes, locally sourced guns and other homemade weapons. Elder was made a unit commander, eventually leading 8,000 men. A kind of initiation process developed. Each member had to swear his allegiance on the Koran. Most, like Elder, belonged to the Kanuri and Hausa ethnic groups, the same groups that made up most of Boko Haram. Elder began renting an office to run Sector 5. He was the only sector commander to do so. The, the auditor's office had given him a leave of absence for this new public service while still paying his salary, and so he wanted things to be official, to be run properly. From the time he woke up to when he finally fell asleep, still restless, Elder responded to calls alerting him to terrorist sightings, and pending or ongoing attacks, and recent abductions and killings. Elder thrived on the danger, and, he, and on the responsibility of having the fate of lives in his hands. His own life and work had suddenly acquired a meaning he had never imagined possible. 
He didn't show us fatigue and was relentlessly optimistic about their chances of defeating Boko Haram. And so the boys under his direction and the people around him began seeing him as both commander and father figure, a sliver of light to follow in the darkness. Elder was the one who's caught his 18-year-old nephew and brought him in. It had to have been him. When he heard the boy had come back to Maiduguri, he went looking for him and found him with AK-47s. To Elder, the guns were proof that his nephew belonged to the terrorists. But his nephew went further. He confessed to killing more than 30 people and even threatened to kill Elder. I asked him, is this the way we brought you up, Elder recalled. You know, the first thing before you start this job, you will take an oath. The oath is that you will not hide anybody, whether it's your friend or relative. Elder was the first of the family to see him when he returned and the last person to talk to his nephew before he took him to the military. It hurt Elder to see him that way. He was Elder's family, his blood. Now what had he become? Elder refused to accept that his nephew could be rehabilitated. His mind was polluted and his actions were unforgivable. His betrayal enraged Elder. We have no regret for anybody if you're a Boko Haram member, he said, because we had suffered a lot at the hands of them. We have lost so many people. He watched the military execute his nephew with satisfaction. Elder's brother had said little of the news that Elder had so swiftly caught his son, turned him into the authorities, and then watched him die. His brother must have been upset, I said. No, he was not upset, Elder said quickly. And his brother's wife? Nobody was upset in the family because anyone who, brings who, anyone who just brings destruction to the community, we will never stay with him, he said. But his brother refused to talk to me. He said he didn't want to revisit his son's death. Elder eventually admitted that his brother did feel bad that his own blood had joined this type of people. His brother and sister-in-law had been forced to watch their son turn into someone they didn't recognize. Amazing. Um, may I allow a full-throated endorsement of the rest of the book? Um, there's so much care and thoughtfulness in the way Alexis approaches the stories that she shares, um, so you should all buy it and read it. Um, so um, to offer a little bit of context, I suppose, in the way I approached, yes, to offer a little more context in the way I approached my storytelling, um, I'm very argumentative. Uh, and as you can hear, I grew up in the U.S. Um, and I found myself in countless dinner parties and cocktail parties as a kind of defender of African um, realities. Uh, and so I felt it was quite important to arm and equip myself with relevant statistics and anecdata and the kinds of things that help you win arguments about Africa. And so I guess that will be my pitch to you all. This, this book is... Um, Across 18 different countries, um, I spent about two years based in Kenya reporting the project and um, focus on two big narratives. One, um, the disconnection between the citizen and the state and the ingenuity and business models that we've never seen anywhere else in the world. So, um, I will start. I'm going to read two, two sections. Um, one is one that should be familiar to those of us who are Nigerian, and one is kind of a general discussion about states and, and government in Africa. So, who here has heard of 419? Raise your hand. Okay, so I'm gonna skip the part where I explain that. I believe these emails are proof of a trend that promises to transform Africa at large. The scams are really about connection. It is no accident that the globalization of 419 has coincided with the spread of internet connectivity. The late 1990s explosion of internet cafes in sub-Saharan Africa created shared and slow but cheap connections to the World Wide Web. The most common offenders of the code remain young men who exploit this novel connectivity to make a profit. By subbing in a new location for each manufactured emergency, Manila, Mumbai, Madrid, these scammers travel the world, bathed in the light of their computer screens. The scams are also about disillusion. Of course, cash is a motivation. But the Yahoo boy's naughtiness also comes from a sense of empty formal alternatives. In fact, the 419 scramble for foreign assets stemmed from the precipitous drop in value of the Naira, Nigeria's currency. 
Scamming for a living was one way of exiting an institutional framework that had failed to provide jobs. One youth, having been successfully prosecuted by the beleaguered Nigerian Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, gave an anonymous interview explaining how and why he became a scammer. I come from a poor family in Lagos, Nigeria. We did not have very much money and good jobs are hard to find. I was approached to work for a gang master when I was 15 because I had done well in school with my English and I was getting to be good with computers. The gang master was offering good money and I took the chance to help my family. In the year before I was arrested, I earned about $75,000 for my family. I bought my family a better house and drove a BMW. I had mobile phones and laptops and everything that comes with having lots of money. So again, 419 is about drive. Nigerians tut tut about 419, half joking, half mortified. But its inventors are sometimes the smartest kids in the room, the best with English, critical thinking, and computers. At the very least, they demonstrate a tenacity that is endemic to successful entrepreneurs from Oprah Winfrey to Nigerian Aliko Dangote, the richest man in Africa. In another life, the Yahoo boys may have enjoyed above board business success. As Apple co-founder Steve Jobs noted in a 1995 interview, a thin line divides genius and crime. I know from my own education, this is now Steve Jobs, that if I hadn't encountered two or three individuals that spent extra time with me, I'm sure I would have been in jail. I could see those tendencies in myself to have a certain energy to do something. It could have been directed at doing something interesting that other people thought was a good idea or doing something interesting that maybe other people didn't like so much. The Yahoo boys may lack the primary school teachers, the elder mentors, or the Silicon Valley structures to guide them away from criminal activities. Instead, they leverage ambition, resourcefulness, and tools at hand, including their own wits, to pursue a vilified but beneficial livelihood. Equipped with only an email address, these criminals have earned millions of dollars in international notoriety solving the common African experience of economic stagnation and proving that you can make something from nothing at all. Academic writer Louis Chude Sokei, in a wonderful essay on the topic of Nigerian internet scams, seems to be smiling. It is hard not to be impressed, he writes. Chude Sokei believes the scammers are the public face of West Africa's intimacy with digital media and technology and of Nigeria's refusal to wait passively for either justice from their political system or global charity. While I don't condone criminality, I too refuse to clutch my pearls about 419. From a bird's eye view, the virtual crime wave begins to look like an amazing new kind of entrepreneurship. The Yahoo boys embody a spirit I constantly confront when traveling in Africa. I've begun to call it konju, the specific creativity born from African difficulty. As it turns out, uncertain electricity, clogged roads, and non-existent social protections can make life tough, but they also produce an extraordinary capacity for making do. So that's Kanju, a theme throughout the book about doing more with less. And I'm gonna read just a bit about state failure um, and the connection between citizens and government, which in many cases actually drives these workarounds and this innovation. Um, and there's a whole lot here about colonial history if you are interested in that kind of thing and like to win arguments. Um, but I will start. Um, the truth is that African state divisions are less important than you would think. And as with Somaliland, frequently ignored, 73% of households in Africa do not speak the official language of their countries. In other developing countries, that figure is 28%. The rural border between Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana is non-existent. It runs through a village whose residents have lived and traded together for decades. Fulani pastoralists are present in all 17 West African countries. My Nigerian ethnic group has historic ties to French-speaking Benin, the seat of the expansive pre-colonial kingdom once known as Dahomey. A long decade of armed conflict sent a generation of Africans scuttling between Ghana, Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Likewise, in East Africa, part-time refugees commute between Congo and Uganda. 
Despite waves of conflict in the North Kivu region of the DRC, people see no reason to give up their crops. Until the fighting passes, and eventually it does, they head over the border. Economic interconnections also matter more than passports. The sagging economy in Southern Africa has produced a wave of migration into theoretically more stable South Africa. A great consolidation of coastal, trade-linked cities is taking place in West Africa. Already, Nigerian parents send their kids to college in Ghana, where some cross the border with Togo to buy cheaper cigarettes. The introduction of multi-lane Chinese-built highways will accelerate this commercial integration. East Africa's biggest cities and economic clusters lie along the Mombasa-Kampala Railway, begun by the British in 1896. The tracks are not really a border, but a seam, one that is far more helpful in comprehending the region. African borders, like the price of informal sector goods, are highly negotiable because the majority of African nations have a legitimacy crisis. States exist within jigsaw boundaries, lack an organic spirit of nationalism, are prone to division, and are difficult to rule. Their political anatomy was defined by outsiders and then mismanaged by the ragtag institutions they left behind. They don't represent life as lived. This has essentially created a situation where governments fail to provide services to people. And I'm just going to read a quick summary of the things that new and clumsy states have created. The world has watched this story repeat itself throughout the 20th century. Even if colonial leftovers, say, the British-style schools that educated my parents, persisted in the 1960s and 1970s, they did not flourish. National leaders rejected the idea of civic responsibility. Self-interested decisions at the center punished ordinary people at the periphery. These decisions wounded the private sector, too. For every year that a single African political party remained in power, firm productivity, growth rates, and sales growth for manufacturing plummeted. Uh, and I think that I will stop there, although I'm looking to find this one section that I think indicates um, the way ordinary people experience this failure and drive some of the activism that Alexis uh, reports on so well. In Kenya, it's learning that the immigration ministry has lost its copy of your work permit application, but can retrieve it for an unspecified fee. In Ethiopia, it's arriving at the airport to find that the power is out. You try landing planes in that event. In Ghana, it's the discovery that your university is on strike, again, and you'll have to wait nine months to finish your degree. In Zimbabwe, it's the smirk that comes from seeing a billboard papered with your now worthless local currency. In South Africa, it's having an application to start a business returned after six months because you use blue, not black ink. In Liberia, it's seeing girls walk miles into the bush to fetch water that should be coming out of the pipes underground. In Nigeria, it's a realization that a promised road has been paid for, but not paved. Everywhere, it's the basic understanding that you are on your own. I noticed some laughter when you talked about Ghana and um, you might have to wait nine months for your degree. I know some Ni Nigerian students are like, nine months is nothing. <laughs> sometimes it's one year, sometimes it's two. <laughs> so they, they would probably take nine months <laughs> over that. Um, great stories that you shared. And I wanted to talk about the, the whys and the hows. So in both your books, you talk about things, but in very different ways. So I wanted to ask you first, Alexis, like, you decided to take the headline religious extremism and you distilled it into personal stories, into um, individual things so that perhaps people would look beyond the headline and think about the people who are actually day-to-day -day affected by these things. How did you decide that that was how you wanted to craft this? And why did you even decide that this was a topic that you wanted to, um, to, to make the focus of your book? I mean, as a journalist, who, who's been writing on and off about Africa for the past decade, um, I, I knew the kind of stories I like to read that I wasn't seeing a lot of. Um, 
a, a lot of stories from the continent were very sensationalized. They were dramatic. Um, there's um, a, a focus, a tendency to want to focus on the most extreme things that are happening, which I thought, I'm also covering some of those things, but how do we talk about in a way where we're humanizing people at the center of it, where we're portraying people um, as having agency and talking about their interiority and talking about their interests and concerns and desires, about Africans as three-dimensional people instead of just people who are suffering um, at the heart of some disaster. And I think what both Diana have, in, Diana have in common is that we are writing about people who are essentially on their own, as you said, because in, um, in all of these areas, the government is not much help, and so people are trying to figure out things on their own, protect their families, their communities, and do for themselves. And so I just wanted to show that, that people are doing for themselves. They're not waiting for a Western savior to come in. They certainly aren't waiting on their governments, um, and that they don't really need anyone besides themselves. They're taking care of themselves. So, Daya, you did the same sort of in your book with some people. So we have, for example, Gladys, who's the um, farmer in Kenya. You talk about Anas in Ghana, who's doing his investigative reporting with one or two little ethical or unethical tweaks there, but he's doing the job. Um, how did you decide to tell those stories, but within, for example, you know, statistics and hard figures and things like that as well? Um, well... You know, Alexis and I, who are actually very good friends, just so you know, um, I think there is something to having been in the States and having had this kind of diasporic experience where you, you know that what you're reading in the Western media isn't true. You just know it because you know it, because you've seen it. And so trying to find a way to um, push back and to, do so, and to do so in a way that is not sentimental. I think that's very important to both of us because Alexis's book is not sentimental. It's very clear-eyed, it's very thoughtful, um, it's very truthful and real. Um, and, and, and I don't think that it helps to have only positive stories about Africa. I think what we need is more stories about Africa. And so that was the approach that I took. I also had, um, I will confess to having a lot of insecurity about writing the book myself. Um, at the time that I got this incredible opportunity, I was 25 years old. Um, I had not lived, for example, in Nigeria. Um, and I, I wanted to tell a story that felt so big and so important that I had to do it, but I also felt like, who am I? Um, and so I spent a lot of time researching. Like, I got in the weeds about gross domestic product and is that even a useful measure? Um, and like how actually does agricultural productivity like increase or decrease if you have state support or not, like the weeds. Um, and I think that it was valuable to me to then having understood the sort of fundaments of conventional development practice to then cross-reference the individuals I met and the people I was able to speak with and say how are they situated with respect to this large global project of African development? And the answer was they were actually very disconnected, that there was a fundamental disconnect between like whatever's happening in Geneva and whatever's happening you know, in some local town. Um, and that helped identify a few strong voices that could carry the story of innovation and what they were doing differently from what the international community was doing. Um, and, and hopefully that 30,000 feet and then very close up is, captures enough of the range of, of what's happening on the continent in contemporary Africa to be useful to people. Again, in winning arguments, because you're all gonna go out and win arguments about Africa after this. Um, you mentioned something that I actually wanted to touch upon, which is your perspective as Nigerians who have been brought up in the diaspora. Um, I was curious, when you were writing, even though you, you know, had lived in Nigeria and you've obviously gone to these other countries and worked and, um, and observed these people and talked to them and you did the same, were there times where you had to check your, I'm not really from here privilege, one, and after writing and the reception that you got, were there any, was there any pushback? Well, what do you mean? You're not even really from here. What are you saying? That's not really how things are. I wanted to know, so can you uh, start? Yeah, um, well one, I would say the experience that I had in sort of touring and speaking to audiences about the book, 
the people who were like front row stands, it was the Africans, right? Because the audience for the book has been extremely global, right? There's like a Japanese translation for businessmen who want to get into Africa. There's, you know, people who are in tech want to hear more about this M-Pesa and mobile money. Um, and then there are people who are more traditional, like human rights practitioners, who want to understand how they can be more effective by designing their projects to be sensitive to realities on the ground. So it has had a very wide audience, but the people who have like come through have been people who are African who are like, this is what I have been saying all along. And so that has felt really gratifying to me to feel that there is a dialogue that I've helped in some way around people who, like me, have felt this disconnect between what people say about us and what we know about ourselves. Um, and I think, you know, you probably have stories from Somalia as well, but I thought when I was there, I felt that I was being asked to be part of the norms of Somalia as a dark-skinned woman reporter in a way that would not have been true if I were, for example, a, a white female reporter. And so there was continually a sense that until I opened my mouth, I I was, they could claim me which helped and hurt, so. Similarly, I mean, when I was reporting in these four places, what helped was being able to blend in a lot. I mean, I mean, Nigeria, I am Nigerian. But, what, you know, I am very aware that I, I did grow up in the West, I grew up abroad, so I wanted to make sure the stories I told were in my subject's words. Um, I tried to not judge anything morally, I just tried to present, let them present their stories, and I thought, that would be the most honest way to, um, to, to fairly portray subjects. Because I find a lot of times when subjects are reporting on the continent, they're going when, with already in a perspective of maybe pity, or, and that kind of pity leads to a feeling of superiority over the people they're trying to write about. They're thinking, oh, these poor people, let me talk about how bad things for them or have been for them. But I'm spending time with people, I'm in their houses, we're having lunch, we're joking, we're talking, I'm meeting their kids. So I'm already seeing parts of their lives that I find have not often been portrayed in, in a lot of articles and I wanna show all of those sides of those people. Um, because but as I said, when I'm on the continent, I don't see much difference between myself and the people I'm reporting on besides the fact that we ended up in different circumstances. But when you're reporting on someone who looks basically just like you, and in some cases is of your ethnic group or came from the same place your father came from, there's just like less of a barrier and it, it's able to create more intimacy between the people, um, the journalists and the people you're writing about. And I often ended up caring a lot for the, uh, my subjects. Um, so yeah, whether I was in Somalia writing about girls who play basketball despite death threats against them or an activist in Mauritania who's fighting against slavery, um, I, I did feel that, that bond, and, and um, even though there was, you know, there, there, there was a distance because I wasn't from the places they were writing about, I, I felt like, let me, let me let the people um, tell their stories in their own words and kind of record it as faithfully as I can. I wanted to talk about the theme of defiance, resistance, resilience. Um, in, in your book, as we mentioned, Kanju is you know, it's sort of a, an ongoing theme, and you, you know, talked about just um, the acts of resistance that are not necessarily like, for, ha for example, elder. You know, some acts of resistance are for Aisha, who's a basketball player in Somalia, who, whose resistance is, I'm still gonna wear my track pants under my jilbab, and I'm still gonna go and play basketball, despite the fact that I'm getting death threats, and I'm just gonna wake up, I'm gonna get up, and I'm gonna go. Now this was probably a bit, it was intentional for you to tell it that way. But what I'm curious about, Dio, is was it intentional for you um, or was it something that you discovered along the way when you were researching and telling these stories that actually this conjuness, this we're gonna find a way around the system even when the system doesn't work, was it something that you set out to prove because you already knew or was it something that you found and decided that, you know what, this is gonna be an overarching theme because this is, this is so big that it's got to be the story. Um, well, the book initially was a book about like cell phones in Africa, right? That was the kind of pitch. Cell phones in, cell phones in Africa. Africa, I was like, cell phones, Africans have them, discuss. 
And as I started to do my initial research and, and sort of deepen the inquiry and meet more people, talk to individual subjects, I think it became like, why is it that the mobile phone is so transformative here? Because cell phones, you know. But, but the idea that people who have a cell phone full stop become super users. They know how to take it apart. They have the, you know, they're taking the battery out all the time. They're switching SIM cards. It becomes something that is more than what has been marketed to them. And I think that that is true for so many different kinds of material goods in Africa, where you need to recycle and reuse and reinvent and take inventory and say, what do I have? What do I, what can I do? What can I do without? That is why cell phones are interesting in Africa, right? And so that kind of led me into a whole discussion about the creativity that comes from scarcity and the other sectors to which that spirit can be applied. So that, in truth, is the, the way things evolved and, and how I was like, there's the ingredients of creativity are really here um, on this continent. And let me try and explain how that works to the outside world. Um, I also wanted to talk about, in your last chapter, you talked about exit voice or loyalty. Um, and I found some common themes, you know, in, in both of them. In, in when a system doesn't work, you either leave it, you make noise about it, or there's, and then the aspect of loyalty uh, was interesting to me because a lot of times the um, idea of patriotism and just stick it through is, it's, not a, it's a theme that used to be more, I guess, strong in the past, now not so much. Um, Alexis, in your book, loyalty was displayed for me probably the most strongly with the story of Eunice and Bosco. Um, Eunice is, uh, was kidnapped and given to Bosco, who was an LRA fighter, um, and after even escaping the LRA, she decides to stay with Bosco. Um, I, I want to know how that story, I mean, you talk about it a little bit in the book, but how that story was such a, was so important for you to tell, you know, even after you, you went back a few times, you've gone back several times to talk to them, even seeing, you know, their children grow up. Um, why was it so important to you to talk about that story, which is something that we don't really hear much about? Yeah, actually, I was talking about this yesterday. Um, I wanted to tell, you know, some of the stories in this book are, 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 are uh, they have a lot of moral grays, I like to call them. It's not sort of just um, talking about good or evil. We're talking about, I talk about, like, what's in between and, and what the concept of a perpetrator or a victim is and how you sort of, and how people deal with things that have happened in their lives that maybe they weren't um, proud of or happy of and how they managed to, to get through to the other side. And so this story of this couple who were both kidnapped by the Lord's Resistance Army, and as you said, she was given to him and decided to reunite with him. At first I couldn't understand it. I thought, is this real? This is really happening. Um, they weren't the only couple that went through this situation. But I thought what, what, what they were doing was still an important story to tell. It's, it was a story I'd never read before. And, um, you know, as, as kind of like you said, in this book, I wanted to talk about the full range of resistance, not just like the activists who's staging protests, but people who make more quieter acts of, um, of defiance. And in this story, it's about a woman who, by choosing to love who she wants to be with and stay married to a man she wants to be with, despite the shock of her community, is an act of resistance. Loving who she wants is an act of defiance after this rebel group tried to take any kind of sense of identity and family and love away from her. So um, it's a story that I feel like you have to read in its entirety to really get all the nuances. But I mean, that, that's what the kind of the joy of doing this book was, is being able to tell all the nuances of lives that we don't often hear about and not just kind of some kind of 800 you know, sh word piece that uh, is all shock value. So for you, Dio, um, I felt like reading, I, I saw a lot more exit, you know. So did you feel for you what you observed? That was really mostly it. And I want to ask, three years after the book has come out, have you noticed if that's changed? Is it worse? Is it better? That is a great question, especially the question about, like, the durability of some of the arguments and the, the inquiry. Um, 
So, so this framework, exit, voice, and loyalty, it's like if you are in a system, whether it's a business or a government or even a family structure, where you see something wrong, you have three options. You can exit, you can express voice, or you can be loyal. And um, consistently, most of the people that I profiled chose to exit the system, or maybe they were forced to exit the system. And exits can take the form of having a generator because you are no longer going to be on the, the power grid that is insufficient. It could mean sending your kids to a religious school because the state school, it might be free, but you're not about that for your children. It may be that um, you have security because you know the police force is not going to take care of you and your family or you have weapons at home or you are worried about your family and you take it into your own hands as, as some of the stories Alexa shared has gone. The exit may be, um, uh, you know, having um, your money abroad. It may be that you keep your money in cash. It may be that you have chosen to remove yourself from the institutions that are insufficient to meet the needs of you and your family. And one of the things that I noticed about all of these exits is they're actually very, they're focused on the elite, right? Private security, private healthcare, private school, these are all things that are very expensive and that tend to exacerbate inequality in many different African countries and cities. And so a lot of the businesses that I ended up profiling, the model for how they operated was like, how can I take this exit and how can I make this cheaper? How can I make this more democratic? How can I make sure that more people have access to this option when the traditional alternative is, is bad? Um, and so I looked at low-cost private schooling, which is quite common across sub-Saharan Africa. Many parents do not choose to send their children to public schools. They go to madrasas, they go to religious schools, they go to mom-and-pop schools. Um, and so I looked at that trend and I said, okay, people have already voted with their feet on this education thing. In this situation with energy, not everybody can buy a generator and put diesel in it. It's expensive. It's a tax on poor people all across the continent. So I looked at businesses looking at alternative energy in a distributed fashion. Solar, largely in rural areas where you could wait 50 years to see a power line. And so the exit, taking that as a given, at least for now, we hope this will change in the future, but people are not going to wait for that. And so making these exits scalable and democratic um, was really the goal of a lot of the entrepreneurs that I, that I spoke with. So um, I guess that's a nuanced way of discussing the way people exit. And, you know, I think there has been a genuine increase in the appetite for voice um, in recent years, right? When I was in the middle of reporting this, it was like the Arab Spring was happening. That was like the thing. If you guys remember what that was like in 2011, 2012, I mean, it was like all across North Africa, the Middle East, there were protests. And I was like, why aren't we protesting in Nigeria? Like, it's just as bad. But there was something that kept people from that kind of activism. And I, don't, I think it may be changing, and I hope that it will. Um, obviously, governments need to be held accountable, and citizens need to do that. And so voice is very important. But loyalty, I know before that. <laughs> um, I, I, I feel like we've been hogging well, I've been hogging the mic a little bit. Um, so I'd like to open it up because I know we only have about seven minutes left um, for any questions that you may have for Alexis or for Dial. So if you have any questions, please shoot your hand up so that we can go to, okay, we've got one over here and one, okay, so you and then. Thank you. Um, Barbara Barungi from Uganda, but I live in Nigeria. Alexia, um, the parallels between Boko Haram and the Lord Resistance Army in Uganda, did you by any chance look at that? I did, yes, because... Um, I did, yes, because um, actually in both of the stories I write in the book, um, they're dealing with those groups, and there's a moment where I'm writing about the fact that my characters in northern Uganda um, they, they had been kidnapped as children, and then I'm writing about in Nigeria, in northeastern Nigeria, where my main, uh, I also write about a schoolgirl there named Rebecca who was kidnapped in Chibok, escaped, went back to school in, in her own act of defiance, and I was just amazed at the way both of these groups started as something, 
you know, kind of, kind of local rebellions to help restore ethnic dominance and restore a kind of equality and religious purity. And then they both devolved in the same way. They both turned against their own people and, and wreaked havoc against the most innocent. Um, but then also, you know, how the people they terrorize in their own ways try to regain some kind of normalcy, try to escape, try to fight back and, and um, continue their lives. So th there's an incredible amount of parallels, you're right, that was striking to see. Hi, Jessica Horn. Um, thanks to both of you. Firstly, I think it's always brilliant to have African women writing nonfiction because we also need to be able to frame ways of seeing the world um, yeah, in nonfiction space. Um, so, I mean, I guess I had a question. It's maybe mainly for Dio, but when I was listening to you speaking, I was thinking, how African, quote unquote, is the dynamic of what people do in the face of state failure? Because, in a way, it's just, it's, you could call it entrepreneurship, you could call it actually anarchist self-reliance, I mean. But I was just thinking about the United States, where if you're poor, um, and if you're poor and intersection of black or Latino or whatever, you face a very similar scenario of a failure of the state to take its responsibility. And so, for example, there's this, this uh, notion in hip-hop culture, there's no justice, just us. Because actually, when it comes to engaging law enforcement or the state, they're more likely to kill you or to harm you than they are to protect you. And it's the same in hosp public hospitals are appalling, school systems, public school system is appalling, and so people also innovate in that way. So I'm just wondering if, if that makes sense to you as a connect, and also if it would make sense to also help people um, in the States or in Europe or in other places connect with this concept of what Africans are doing because I think it also happens anywhere where there's structural violence and people are responding to it by trying to reassert their dignity or their possibility. Yeah, that's brilliant analysis, what she said. I think um, there are so many parallels between people who are in the underclass everywhere. And I think um, there's one way of looking at it which is from, which is like political scientific, right? Which is to look at the, the distinctions that Africa has in the legitimacy of its states. Um, it is actually very unusual that African borders reflect so little about the economic and social and, and ethnic communities in the region. That is distinct from Latin America, it is distinct from Europe, it is distinct from Asia. Um, and even in the situation of colonization, the decolonization moment for Latin and Central America um, fundamentally returned in some sense, and you can dig in deeper on this um, in chapter three, um, the existing structures and more importantly the language because the statistic I read out earlier where language, I mean people do not speak the language of the state at home on this continent and that's not true everywhere. And I think that actually is a nice stand-in for the disruption um, and the challenges that come from that kind of jet lag um, that have continued to compound and make what's happening in this continent worse in terms of the governance. So there's that analysis. But I think you are absolutely right that public service provision fails people without privilege everywhere. And a great host of resiliencies, especially the idea of just us and family is very, very important in Africa um, and to a certain extent in America, although there's plenty of studies around the sort of dissolution of the family and you could also tunnel on that for a while. What I will say is that as an American, I've been, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, just like appalled at the last year um, of politics in my country and it's especially highlighted for me like we, we give so much grief to places like Nigeria um, with respect to its governance and uh, we're on the highest of horses in places like the UK and the US. Um, and, and I think it's increasingly clear that the rot reaches every country equally. And we need to have a more holistic conversation around what it means to, to build capacity for the weakest among us using everyone's resources and ingenuity and not just um, what we have believed about liberal democracy as exported by the United States. Um, I think it's very important essentially for America to check itself um, in the way it um, seeks to, I don't know, export respectability politics everywhere. I think we have time for one last question. Does anyone have a question? Ah, okay. My name is Dada Ola I'm from Aki in Abeokuta. I'm a poet. 
Uh, let me first of all uh, look at the issue of culture shock. You've experienced uh, several culture shocks all over the places. Then uh, were you able to reflect that in, in your work? Uh, would you tell us the most, sh most sh culture shocking aspect, having traveled widely? Now to you. You talked about the renewable energy for Africa. Uh, I mean, to solar energy too. I've seen quite a lot of problems with the issue of solar energy. I have a son who studied solar energy physics. Up to now, he's still experiencing getting things properly in shape. The so-called rich, they don't believe much in uh, uh, solar energy. They believe in all these silence uh, gensets. And you see a feature for solar energy, which is most potent for Africa. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, that's actually a good question because and one of these stories I write about Somalia, and, you know, I was thinking about it the other day because I'm sure you guys heard the news about, um, maybe it's now been a couple of weeks ago, Somalia had its largest terrorist attack um, recently. Over 400 people were killed. And a lot of people in Somalia and the Somali diaspora were upset that um, there, was, there didn't seem the same... That, there didn't seem to be the same public outpouring of sympathy for that attack like there had been in Paris or, um, or Las Vegas. And I think it's because of the way we tell stories about places like Somalia. So I write in the book that even before I went, um, you know, I saw it as a place of destruction and war and terrorism and I was very uneasy. Um, and then I get there and the woman I'm working with is like, let's go to this beach restaurant. And it's a beautiful beach and it's a restaurant and it actually had been attacked not that long earlier, but people were back taking selfies, eating, uh, enjoying themselves. Just the, and so I just realized in a lot of these places, um, even though there may be extreme situations, it's often the background of people's lives. It's just one part. People are still going to work, still going out, still enjoying themselves, still spending time with their family. And so I wanted to reflect that. So when I talk about Somalia, I do talk about the fact that I came in with these preconceptions. I didn't know how it would be because of how it's been portrayed in popular media, and then how surprised I was, when really I shouldn't have been, that people are still doing the same things there in Mogadishu that they're doing anywhere else in the world. Um, you know, I write about a girl there who is doing a lot of brave things by playing basketball despite death threats, but she doesn't see herself as an activist. I mean, she still wants to go hang out with her boyfriend and, like, you know, go out to the club at night. And so I don't want to paint her as a hero, even though I thought what she's doing is admirable. I wanted to show that she's just part of this, this society, this place that's still trying to get on with life despite the fact that a lot of extreme things are going on. Uh, and, and the solar thing, I mean, it seems so obvious, right? The sun, energy, great, let's use it. Especially here where there's a pain point that's really prominent. Um, sorry, I keep doing that. Um, some of the, the, the challenges um, are, like, you can't be what you can't see, right? You hear that sometimes. Um, and so there needs to be some very visible leadership. Like, it should be, I don't know who, like, Dangote should just put, like, a solar thing on the top of his house, and, and then someone should write about it. And so there's that sort of hearts and minds story around solar energy. And then there's the nuts and bolts of actually building a business that distributes quality solar products the last mile. And that is complicated. And I have seen a lot of different business models across the continent. In Tanzania, it seems to be on the upswing because 97% of households do not have wired electricity. Like, think about that. And so there's more of an impetus there. Um, the business models that I've seen work well is actually um, asset finance, right? So, and this is one of the big challenges in the financial sector in Africa is that people are not allowed to take on debt to buy things that they need, right? Interest rates will be super high. If you wanna buy a car in America, you get a lease. They give you some of the money up front and you pay it back over time. And that is, no one in the United States would think of that as some kind of weird charity project. And yet, asset finance for solar is tried and true and something people pay back um, over three years, the cost of a solar installation. 
every payment comes on time. This company has now seen people paying back their, their solar purchase and then saying, what else can you sell me? So they've started building televisions and air conditioners and other kinds of products that are compatible with the solar because people, when given the opportunity, will invest in things that make their lives better. And that seems so obvious, but it is not something that I've seen people assume when they think about the African consumer. Um, and so hopefully, together, we can help change the narrative both at the level of society and about how we can bring these goods into the market. Um, well, our time is up, but I would like to thank Dio, and I'd like to thank you, Alexis, as well. I hope you all enjoy the session. Um, I wanted to close with something that Dio actually wrote in her book, which I completely applaud, um, a quote from Chino Achebe. And you wrote in there you know, what he said, if you don't like someone's story, write your own. And I think you both did that in wonderful ways. So thank you so much for your work, and thank you for being a wonderful audience. My name is Lamidi Akintobi. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the festival.